Thank you for coming. It's going gonna, it's gonna to get better. I think you should save your applause. I'm Marcia Reed. I'm the chief curator at the Getty Research Institute. I'm the curator of the Edible Monument. The exhibit, which you've probably all seen, focuses on both street food and the offerings that were created for the grand banquets. The period is about 1600 to the early 1800s. At the same time, culinary knowledge was developing and spreading from private cooks. It was the beginning of the time that cookbooks were published, started to disseminate, and the private cooks who worked in the palaces and the castles, the great houses, they worked for the pope and the archbishops, their knowledge was trickling down through society. So it was a lively period. People were starting to transmit information about food. Other people were learning how to cook. New foods were coming in to use. They were coming in from the south and from the islands and from the Americas. And new culinary practices and devices were being invented. But what's very surprising, and I think that we don't know, is how much knowledge about food was already known. I think we think people ate very simply. They didn't. And so it was already in place and being passed down. I'm very happy to welcome our speaker, Ken Albala, who's also from California, the North. He's a professor of history at the University of the Pacific and also director of food studies and MA program in San Francisco. He's authored or edited 23 books on food, both specific types of food and on the importance of food, which is a point I'm trying to make in culture and society, how much of it serves as a way to identify us and our cultures and who we are. I have a shelf of his books over my desk that I used as sources when we were doing the catalog and the exhibition. Some of my favorites are Eating Right in the Renaissance, Cooking in Europe from 1250 to 1650, The Banquet, but then other things, Beans, which was a winner of the Jane Grigson Award in 2008, Pancake, another single food focus, Grow Food, Cook Food, Share Food, and finally, Nuts, A Global History. He also edited A Cultural History of Food, The Renaissance, and the Rutledge International Handbook of Food Studies. He's also co-authored two cookbooks, The Last the lost, <laughs> the lost Art of Cooking, The Lost Art of Cooking, and The Lost Arts of Hearth and Home. His course, Food, A Cultural Culinary History, is one of those great courses that's available on DVDs. His most recent book was just published this fall, Food, A Cultural Culinary History, and um, also at table, Food and Family Around the World was published last fall. With seemingly inexhaustible energy for writing and publishing, he's currently working on a book about noodle soups. And noodles are so popular. I've just been in Japan, and it was just ramen, ramen, ramen every day, all day. Today, Ken is going to discuss the emerging culinary professional practices of making and presenting food because increasingly, in the early modern period, publications and other information which circulated on culinary matters, including the burgeoning cookbooks, which we now take so much for granted. I think cookbooks are among the kinds of publications which are not dying. They're only proliferating. They're only more and more popular. But the early publications also included guides to menus, table settings, the all important ways of setting the table, the shape of the table, what should go on the table, as well as areas of professional specializations, pastry making and carving, to name a few. Along with his extensive research, one of Ken's most important credentials to me is the fact that he writes 
but he also, as you're going to see this afternoon, he cooks. And so he knows what he's talking about. He's done it. He's experimented and he's worked with these practices. Uh, lastly, I highly, highly recommend his website, which is ever changing. And he has a great blog, Ken Abala's Food Rants. It's a really terrific source to just take a break and look at during the day. So now, looking back at the early literature, today Ken is going to reflect for us on how these things were used or not by culinary professionals and offer us some words of wisdom about the quality of this advice. Please welcome Ken. Thank you all so much for coming. Um, I want to first explain how I started cooking these um, strange recipes from the past. Culinary historians usually don't cook. They read the books and they talk about the social meaning of the food or its gender implications or any number of things. And I got to a point in my career where I really just kind of wanted to know what the food tasted like. Um, they do sometimes turn out strange. So um, for the past, let me see if I can pull up this first image. Should I just click on it? There we go, okay. Um, so for the past 15 years or so, I have been cooking historic recipes, mostly from early modern Europe, using the exact ingredients called for as closely as possible and without any substitutions, uh, using comparable kitchen technologies and heating sources, that means you're using an open flame like this guy here, um, and serving in ways that reflect the particular aesthetic of the era. And that often means very elaborate garnishes, serving vessels, eating implements, which had, some of which had just come into use. For example, the fork is pretty much brand new in the 16th century. So the goal was to get a detailed sense, partly of the artistic choices that cooks made, but also to get a, a kind of appreciation of the labor that was involved in this, in preparing these Renaissance dishes. dishes. And in many cases, the choice of a particular cooking vessel was really essential to the dish. So it really it mattered what kind of things you were cooking in. For example, one recipe I'll talk about a bit later is also is a rabbit cooked in a pipkin. It's this little rounded clay vessel that gets set in the fire, um, has three legs and a handle that you stick on the side. Um, it, the recipe does not work in a regular pan on a gas flame. So it's like one of these revelations that you had that you really have to listen to the chefs uh, and when their directions. Um, and numerous other problems, of course, of course present themselves, um, such as ensuring that the species of the plants and animals are the same. Um, in many cases, they're not. Pigs are very, very different now. They're bred to be very lean, and you will dry out at most Renaissance recipes if you use a modern pig. Uh, moreover, many ingredients you just can't get today. You know, I've looked really hard for herons and cranes, and you just, not in the supermarket. Um, and let alone, there's, there's kind of spices that people used in the past, um, like uh, grains of paradise, or cubebs, or um, the uh, cassia bud. You can find these things online now, but when I started, they were just really difficult to find. But the larger problem was really getting a sense of the social context of how these foods were served, how they were carved um, and consumed, and really what they meant to the guests. It's much the same problem, I think, that um, historians of music have been facing for a long time. You know, you can get an instrument that is an exact replica, you can follow the score just the same way you can follow a cookbook, and even the playing styles, I think, can be matched to a certain extent. But the problem is we don't have the same ears today, right? We, it's almost impossible not to cater to our aesthetic preferences or assumptions about what the music would have sounded like or even what the food should have tasted like. Uh, and it's especially difficult with cooking because, of course, these guys don't usually have measurements. They don't have cooking times. Um, and it's very hard not to kind of impose your own taste preferences on the recipe when you're cooking it. Um, or know, for example, how much sugar do you put on when a cookbook author says, un grand foison de sucre, a great deal of sugar, on a roasted chicken. <laughs> Do you dump it on? I don't know. It's actually very good, but still. 
So despite these problems, in my experience, I think if you follow the author's directions, the results are always palatable, and usually they're very, very good. Um, cookbook authors really did know what they were ta talking about, and it's only when you kind of step away and you cease to follow their directions, that's when the disasters start to happen. So replicating these individual recipes, I think it's, it's very useful as a form of historical research. It's actually great as a teaching tool also. Um, but serving an entire meal, on the other hand, that involves a whole new set of problems, including how do you manage the shopping, how do you ensure that the, uh, they're suitable cooking vessels and serving utensils, uh, how do you organize the staff, um, and how do you organize people to serve and to carve if necessary. So these are things that would have all been done by professionals in the past. If you're doing it now, you kind of have to do this on the fly and hope that they don't mess up or drop something in someone's lap, right? So fortunately, there is this enormous literature of uh, banquet management literature. Um, about a dozen works or so, written mostly in Italy. A couple of them are actually in the exhibit, um, mostly in the 16th and 17th century. And they are addressed to this figure that I'm going to talk about today. This is the scalco. Okay, The scalco is, um, I think you'd translate that as a steward or the impresario, I like even better. He's the guy who is in charge of everything. He's the final say on everything that happens. He oversees the designing of the menu, he manages the staff, and he is above the cook. The cook has to listen to him. Um, he manages the spenditore, who's the person who does all the shopping, the credenziero, who arranges the cold dishes, usually has their own separate kitchen, so you know what a credenza is. There's a staff person just to manage the credenza. Uh, there's also a bottigliere, who manages the wine cellar, and then there's the trinciante, who carves. And if you notice the um, Vincenzo Cervio uh, book in the exhibit, they would carve everything from a whole large bird, like a turkey, in the midair, carving delicate slices that fall onto people's plates, or sometimes as some something as tiny as a plum would be carved at table. So that's a, that's a very specialized task. Um, and then, of course, there's the pages who bring out the dishes, refill the cups. And I always thought this would be a, like a really interesting exercise to teach a whole class in Renaissance banquet management right from these texts um, and train the students in various positions and then have a banquet as their final exam and just see what happens, right? So, so, so I have, um, well, so I've been asked on a, several occasions to manage banquets myself. I don't advertise this, I don't tell people I do this, um, but I want to talk to you today about some of the various hurdles that I've faced and describe how useful this Scalco literature has been. And it's partly like a, just a learning exercise for me, um, and sometimes if there's students there, they learn through the process of cooking. And what I've discovered thus far, I think my, my deepest insight, is that every single cooking venue is completely different. Uh, and to manage a meal is really much more difficult than, let's say, preparing one individual dish or even cooking for a demonstration. Now, you know, you can cook a handful of recipes and hand them out to an audience. That's not very difficult, actually. Um, but serving the meal getting that timing right, coordinating the kitchen and the service staff, calculating the portions, that's really, really difficult. And that's largely what this Scalco literature is about. So the events that I'm gonna describe were all, in fact, completely different. And they required the kind of improvisation and adaptation to each venue that was exactly what this Scalco literature is designed to teach. Uh, it's not like a modern restaurant. You know, in a modern restaurant, you have a set routine and protocols, and there are, uh, but there are a lot more variables in the past. For example, there's not really a dining room. A banquet could be held anywhere. You could hold it in, in a large hall. You could hold it outside. You could hold it at, at someone else's house. So the, um, the number of guests always varied. So it's not like in a restaurant where you have a certain number of tables. You know what's going to be served. You can buy for that number. Um, but then, of course, they're much more dependent on the seasonality of the ingredients, um, the restrictions imposed by the church for Lent. So a lot of the year, you can't serve meat. It's, you have to design fish menus or vegetables. Um, and then there's the consideration of the particular preference of the, uh, of the guests or even their health constraints. That's something that's in a lot of this Scalco literature is you have to know what your master really wants for his health. Um, so remember, there, there wasn't really a list of menu items to choose from. So the Scalco had to plan for each occasion and sometimes even calculate the humoral complexion of his patron in designing each course. And of course, there was, there was the difficulty of staying within the budget because it can't just spend you know, uh, recklessly. 
And most importantly, among all of this, is every dish has to impress the guests um, in very interesting ways. So you want different colors and different textures, different forms of presentation. In some of these uh, menus, what's fascinating is they'll have one ingredient and serve it in 20 different ways. And that really takes some ingenuity. Um, there are also sugar sculptures. You probably saw the picture of Ivan Day doing that and the, the, the big um, sugar sculpture in the exhibit, which is wonderful. And those are made just for the occasion. So everything is designed to display the magnificence of the host. And the fact that this literature records the minute details of the menus for each banquet suggests to me that they're really not, they don't want this to be an ephemeral event. They want a record of exactly what was served um, and that some other person who wants to be a Scalco could read this literature and go, wow, that was amazing, or, um, you know, or, or do it themselves, right? You, you know, it's, it's instructional literature. So what I'm going to describe is a couple of events. The, let me start with a few that aren't really sit-down meals per se, but I want you to, to give you an idea of the range of strange places I have found myself cooking um, and the various obstacles that are, that are pretty typical. Um, I think they're, they're, they're comparable in some way to the, what the Scalcos had to deal with in the past, especially if you're on a strange site or if you're cooking on campaign. This is in Scappy, who's in the, in the exhibit. Um, how do you deal with cooking outside for a large number of people? So that's, that's one thing. Um, but first, let me show you, um, let me turn to me. Um, this is a, a place that I cook. This is a UC Fullerton. And I prepared uh, some dishes from Cristoforo de Messis Bugo. He was a scalco. He was actually a major domo, a little higher position. And the place that they sent me um, is basically a classroom. You can see the funniest part about it is it says, um, no food allowed in this space. <laughs> and, and there wasn't a kitchen. They brought in a sort of burner, a camp burner. Some people found some pots and dragged them in. So I was literally on the fly completely. I think I did three or four different dishes. Um, and you know, really had to uh, do it on the fly, totally. Here was something I must have forgotten in a bag somewhere, and she brought it to me while I was lecturing and cooking at the same time, and then, of course, tasting this stuff. Sometimes uh, there's no f kitchen at all. So this is sort of comparable to, um, to what uh, Scappy had to do. I just dug a hole in the ground. This is, this is um, in Sterling College in Vermont. Um, I was demonstrating uh, the rabbit in the pipkin, in fact, and I, th I think you can see it at my feet in the picture right there. It's the little vessel, which I made also, just for this occasion. Uh, the, this comes from the Good Housewife's Handmaid for the Kitchen, which is 1588. Um, and the the ordeal, and it's a really interesting dish, it's a whole rabbit in that little pot with raisins and onions and a lot of spices and very, very little liquid. And you think, oh my God, that's gonna burn, right? And it does, actually, if you do it on a stovetop. If you do it in this vessel, it, it works very differently. The, the heat sort of uh, radiates around it as if it's set in the ashes, and it just kind of braises, really, really lovely. But that wasn't the hard part. Um, the hard part was getting the rabbit, <laughs> because this rabbit, um, when I arrived there, there was a torrential downpour, and in the middle of the night, I had to drive over this big mountain to get to the farm where they were raising the rabbit, and, you know, sort of the, the roads were muddy, and I was a little, little putt-putt rent-a-car, <laughs> it was like, like on an adventure to find the rabbit, which I did find, okay, so um, I'm amazed I didn't drive off the road. Now, the people in the past, of course, didn't have sourcing problems like this, but they, they had their own, and in fact, the, the, one of the most famous stories in all culinary literature is about this guy Vatel. There's actually even a movie about him um, in which he was the, uh, the Scalco, in fact, for the Prince de Condé in 17th century France. And he uh, found out that a shipment of fish that he expected to arrive to serve that evening hadn't uh, shown up. And in fact, it was a small basket. And he thought, oh my god, I have nothing to serve for these people. And so he um, set up his sword against the wall and ran himself through and killed himself in, in dismay. So, so, so I was, uh, thankfully, I didn't have to do that. I found the rapid. So, so, a similar venue, I think, um, was one that I did. This is what made this so funny is this, this is a, a neighbor of mine who, um, a, an elderly lady who has a re had a really nice backyard. She doesn't anymore because <laughs> I, I did this to it. But it was, it's, um, this is an olla podrida. So it's a, it's a, that's a, a Spanish dish. Um, and I was talking about Cervantes. But the word olla podrida means a rotten pot. So you basically cook all the ingredients together until they're an indistinguishable mass. Uh, but it contains lamb and pig's feet and tongue and chickpeas and turnips 
turnips and partridge and garlic and chestnuts and sausages. And it's got all this stuff thrown into it. And the only real way, way to do it, I think properly, is set out, set, cooked uh, on an open fire. It makes a big difference. Um, but sometimes the cooking is a little more difficult outside. And I hope you saw the illustrations of the pig fests that, that were uh, in this exhibit, because this was a very interesting one. Um, this is a whole pig cooked and served entirely al fresco. There was, we didn't even have a table. But the obstacle was really the cooking logistics here. This pig weighed about 100 pounds, and I brought a skewer with me that I thought would hold the pig. It didn't. It broke almost immediately. And so what we ended up using, I'm not sure you can see it in this illustration, but it's actually a railroad tie. We ran the railroad tie through the pig, and then I wrapped the ends, wrapped part of it in tinfoil so it wouldn't burn. Um, but I had, but the, the really difficult part is a railroad tie is not round, it's square. So I had to sit and turn it a quarter turn every few minutes for about six or seven hours. <laughs> that was a long, detailed, um, you know, I, I can appreciate what people did in the past now. Um, and of course, serving it was just a big knife and hacking it apart and <laughs> plopping it on people's plates. But I think, you know, if you were going to a fair where pig was served, like maybe even the Bartlemy Fair in London or the ones in the illustrations, that's pretty much what would happen. Someone would be cooking it outside and you'd get a, a, a plate or none and walk away with your pig. So let me go back to um, the uh, Oyo Podrida, actually. The Oyo Podrida, I did one in a class for, um, a cla it was actually a class on Cervantes in Melbourne. And I chose this recipe. It's from, from um, uh, Francisco Martinez Montino. He was the chef for Philip III of Spain. Really a fabulous cookbook. Um, but the reason I picked this is that there's a opening passages in Cervantes where he kind of wants you to know the character of Don Quixote. So he says when he cooked his olla on Sundays, he put in more beef than sheep. And I think what, he's, what the author is trying to say is that he was trying to really impress people and that one day a week he had a great meal, the rest of the week he ate lentils and was really frugal. So it sort of gives you an insight into his character in some way. Um, but in any case, the, the person I had, they had to buy all the ingredients before I got there. And when I arrived, I realized that they had bought, instead of chestnuts, they bought canned water chestnuts. <laughs> it's like, no, that's not going to work. And they forgot half the spices. There was no tongue. There was no, you know, tongue is important to the texture of the dish. So I kind of said, okay. And then I get to the place and there's no burner to actually even cook this on. I was like, how do you expect me to cook this? So I put it in the oven. And it was, it was actually okay, surprisingly, in the end. But, um, but the funny thing is, it's a good example of really learning to improvise, you know, doing whatever you can with what you have. So let me go to some full meals. This was the first time someone asked me to serve an entire meal from a historic cookbook, and this is actually from Scappi, if you saw the cookbook in the, in the exhibit. It's his opera. Um, it was published in 1570. Um, Scappi was chef to a handful of successive popes. He ends up being the um, private chef to Pope Pius V, which is really a strange job because Pius V was an ascetic, uh, ascetic so he didn't eat anything. <laughs> so I don't know what this poor chef got to do, but, uh, but he was his personal chef. Um, but the difficulty of reenacting this thing uh, it's, it's comes from the structure of the courses. They don't work the way ours do. Um, I, I told the, the person who was organizing this, it was an opera benefit, in fact, um, that the way that they did things, they would have um, antipasti, cold things, to start, and they'd usually have fruit and sweets to end. But in the middle, you'd have many courses that have pies and soups and meat and fish. And so, so like, every single course is, has everything in it. And then there could be maybe 10, 12 courses in, through a meal. Um, and sometimes they're punctuated with uh, ballet dancing, or there's music, or there's a whole play in between courses. So this is a banquet lasts, you know, sometimes six, eight hours. It's not, not a quick <laughs> ordeal. Um, and what's even stranger is that this would be the main meal of the day. It would start at 11. So you go from about 11 to, say, 5 or 6. Your whole day is basically just eating. Um, you know, and the smaller meal is in the evening. That's, that's a supper. You know, our meaning of supper has just changed. But that's the 5 or 6 o'clock is a much smaller meal. But logistically, we, I had eight guests, I think, and I could not you know, make dozens of courses and string it out for six hours. Um, and so the, so the idea in the past was that any person could choose any dish they want in any course, right? They would be on the table somewhere, someone would bring it to you and serve it. 
um, I couldn't do that. I had to, had to sort of serve this. Uh, this is called a, a modern service a la Russe, which is Russian service, strangely enough. The whole idea of plating in the back and bringing the food out and serving it in courses, that's a Russian idea. The service a la Francaise is when you place everything on the table and everything gets cleared and a whole other course comes out. Um, kind of like on Thanksgiving, except imagine 12 Thanksgivings in a row. <laughs> that's, that's basically it. So. Um, I decided that, I, what you see here is I decided to make all the food from scratch, meaning not that I bought the stuff, but I actually was working on a cookbook about this, so I cured the olives myself. I made the cheese from raw milk. Um, I think there's salami on there, which I cured myself. I pickled the fennel. So this is all stuff um, that went on this plate. And ironically, <laughs> these are not things Scappy himself would have done. He was a cook, right? He was not a scalco. He was not the credenziero. That's the person who would supply this stuff. Um, and there's even a telling passage in the opera where he says, um, I'm not really going to describe in details how to make salami. This is, that was something that the, the papal court would have bought but from a professional. He says, this is not part of my professional duties, but I just happened to be working on this, so I thought I would uh, bring all of those things. Um, and uh, fortunately for this one, I had someone else serving. And it's for eight people, you really do need someone else. You can't be cooking and serving, even for that number of people. And then you can see the, the setting is really uh, delightful. Um, so the next one, this next um, image I'm gonna show you um, this is not actually a sit-down meal per se, but it was such a weird and fascinating um, experience for me um, that um, I think it was, it, it was prepared and, and obviously drawn directly from the Scalco books, um, but the project was a film. Uh, it was about the composer Monteverdi, who's a 17th century, you know, the, sort of the inventor of modern opera. And um, I want, what they want, the director wanted some scenes of cooking that went alongside those of the composing to show that the music and the, and the food and the art were basically doing the same thing, aesthetically. And the amazing part, I don't know, I didn't know how films work, but apparently he said, you know, we have someone paying for this film, so buy anything you want. <laughs> buy whatever ingredients you want, um, buy any equipment you need. We ended up buying a big 50-pound marble mortar and pestle, <laughs> which was a fortune, but all right, uh, so why not? Various molds. But the most amazing part is he rented a space um, in a medieval castle <laughs> to shoot the film um, on the parapet, strangely enough. It was outside because it's got an open oven. And it's um, on the border between Germany and... It's in Germany, uh, close to the Belgian border. It's in Nijdegen is the, the place. So I basically had to use the equipment that they would have used uh, in the early 17th century, the time of Monteverdi. Um, and I had, of course, never cooked in this space before. I'd never made the recipes before. <laughs> so it was kind of uh, terrifying, you know, if everything goes wrong on film. So let me show you. So what I'm going to show you is a little clip that goes along with the... Um, with the, that's the whole, it's a full-length film. This is just a little clip that I'm in uh, making a pie, which comes from one of these... Um, I think it's Lancelotti. It comes from a 17th century cookbook. But let me show this. The wood fired oven, basically.
Um, it was actually a really weird pie. I don't know if you can tell what was in it. Um, it's veal and gooseberries and spices, and it's a meat pie. Okay, help. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, can you just put it back on the images? Thanks. So, so it's basically, um, so the rest of this meal is actually even weirder. Um, there was a, an asparagus dish um, that served in a, uh, oh, I'm sideways. That's me. Anyway, the, that's the, the pie when they took the pictures of it. So if you can see in the back, there's an asparagus dish that is served in a butter sauce. This is from Stefani, who's a 17th century cook, um, a 17th century Bolognese cook, that includes ambergris, which is this sort of ball of wax that forms in a whale's stomach, and it coughs it up, and it floats in the ocean for a while, and it, and it has this really bizarre, alluring aroma that um, is worked into the butter sauce. And so when people are eating it, it's like, it's very, very strange and, and lovely. Um, and then I also cook gnocchi. I'm not sure you can see that. Maybe I've got a, another picture there. Nope, that's another one. Hang on. Um, oh, so there, there it is. There's the gnocchi in the back. That comes from Messes Bugo. Uh, that's in another uh, bizarre sauce with a lot of sugar on it, which is also very strange. So, um, so that worked really well. You know, it was, it was a whole meal. But let me show you um, a couple of others. This is... Um, uh, part, partly an opportunity for me to test out a couple of recipes from a cookbook. I, was tra I translated this with a friend, um, and this is just a history department party, and I, so I could use uh, everyone's labor, basically, and claim that it was a learning opportunity. Uh, but the cookbook is the, the Livre for Excellent de Cuisine, uh, a very good, excellent book of cooking, basically, and from the 1540s. Um, it has menus, it has recipes, a lot of them involve games, so I tried to you know, get ingredients that I, could, that I could use. So this, what you see here is the, some students making servalot by hand, okay? so, which means they, don't, they didn't have meat grinders and stuffers and all that stuff, and the recipe actually says stuff it into a casing, so that was, you know, get kids' hands and intestines, they love it. Um, and uh, so this was a, a dish that we cooked in, in the fireplace. You can see there's a little me mechanical turn spit, very much like the one illustrated in Scappy. Um, I've got a spider in there, and um, I thought this was a duck, but man, that looks like a chicken to me now that I'm seeing it. Um, this was a, um, a recipe that he has that I really love. It's called a crepe. It's a crespella or something like that. What we would call it a funnel cake today, but it's basically this uh, perforated bowl with batter poured in that drops into the hot boiling butter and then it's sprinkled with sugar and cinnamon. I love this recipe, it's so good. Um, but it's, I just you know, sort of followed uh, what, it, what they were talking about. Um, and um, we also cooked something in the wood-burning um, oven that I have in the backyard and things, things like that. So it was really like largely experimental. And there were some of the dishes I thought, there's no way the students are going to eat this stuff. One was a, um, a f pie of sole. So you imagine fish sort of arranged in a pie that had rose water on it and sugar and a ton of spices. And I thought, this, they're going to find it too strange. Um, it was gone. They, they ate the whole thing. Um, so, so the, um, you know, the best part about the event is partly the cooking itself, explaining the dishes to the students, having them cook from my own translations, which was fun, and then, of course, eating everything. But this was a large group of people. It was about 30 people, so there was a ton of food. Um, we made about 10 different dishes. And the best part is that I myself had never cooked these recipes before, so I was just, you know, basically uh, hoping that it would work. So the next set of images uh, I'm going to show you are from an event that I did in uh, just this past spring. Uh, in, uh, at Webster College in Vienna. And uh, what was strange is I was teaching there for a week, so I kind of got to know the students. They were very odd. They were all wealthy Eastern Europeans studying business. So how they got into a food history class, I have no idea, but they kind of liked it and were having fun. Um, and they decided I would, you know, at the end of this week, we would do a big banquet. So I said, okay, that sounds like fun. Why not? I think there was an unlimited budget because I never, <laughs> never saw the money, but it was uh, 40 people. Um, and to, uh, I decided to cook from Robert May. This is the accomplished cook in the 1660s. Uh, it's one of my favorite cookbooks, my, right after Scappy. It's just a magnificent one, a very English, but it's got, imagine the Baroque flair to the whole thing with tons of garnishes, things like, um, you know, coxcombs and testicles and bone marrow and gooseberries, they, just everything. Imagine like angels and putty flying all over everything. That's basically what it's like. Um, 
And there were a lot of dishes you would never expect in this period. One that I loved, and I'll show you the students cooking it, is ravioli. And it's filled with pea puree. So imagine green peas pounded and cooked down in a ravioli with a beautiful sauce on it. So, so there, were, there were some things like that. There was a grand salad. There was a salmon stuffed with cucumbers. Uh, uh, cucumbers stuffed with salmon, rather. And, but the hardest one, which is really bizarre, is there's a chicken dish. Well, actually, I'll show, show you these. Um, this was the, the place that we, got, we served it. This is the setting. It's a, it was a beautiful mansion um, that the school had moved into. Um, the chicken dish was um, really, oh, actually, this is them serving pies and things that we made. But uh, that's the salmon with the stuffed cucumbers, which I think look great on a plate. Um, this is a grand salad. So they were, surprisingly, 17th century, they're really into salads. Uh, and it includes all, it can include anything. Anything that's cold would come out. And I just, you know, threw, I don't know, olives and fennels and, and, and uh, oranges and things like that. This was the setting, which if you look, the U shape is exactly like those illustrated in the, in the exhibit. Um, those are usually meant many more people, but 40 was enough to handle. Um, and this was the chicken, and, and I know that doesn't look like a chicken, but imagine uh, my surprise. You know, I'm used to a certain size of chicken um, in the United States. They're mostly breast. They're, they're pretty tasteless. Um, in, in Austria, they had the chickens were like this big. It was a tiny little bird, and we bought um, 20 of them for 40 people. And I, the recipe calls for you to take the skin off, take off the flesh, chop it up very finely with vegetables and f fruit. I think we put grapes in there and um, other things and a lot of spices and then put it back into the chicken and, and make it look like chickens again. So that was really, uh, it took me hours just to get the skin off these stupid little birds, but they were delicious and they really <laughs> worked, worked well. Um, we had a quartet playing music from the 17th century, uh, but the really funny obstacle was there was no kitchen here. So we had to cook about a mile of way, get in taxis with all these trays of hot food, bring it uh, you know, to the place, set it up, and set up a like, sort of stage where the students who I'd trained to do this had to serve also. I am amazed that no one got <laughs> harmed in doing this. But I'll show you some pictures. This, this is the setting up table where we're plating everything. Um, this is, this is the, the, the kitchen, which was far away, and we spent all day cooking. Um, the funniest part was they didn't speak English very well, which is even funnier. So I was like trying to explain measurements and you know here and that. The, these, this woman and another one made twice the amount of pastry dough that I needed. Um, uh, this, is, this is the pea puree, and what, what I didn't realize is they bought frozen peas, and we plopped them in a, bowl, in a pot. It was like, okay, cook, do something. It took an hour just for that to defrost. Um, this was the salmon. So, so the point was putting everyone on a different station and not and telling them you do not leave this station. Don't walk over and help someone else. Don't do it. Stay here. Um, this is uh, oh my gosh, she's cutting up. Um, I think there were lamb's tongue. So those are the tongues and other things in that pie in these pies that they made from from May that are wildly garnished and they just. You know, you'd think the Eastern Europeans would know about these ingredients. They didn't, and they were kind of terrified at using them. Uh, sweet breads went in there also, I think, and uh, bone marrow, which you have to extract from the bones and put in. Great pie, though. Um, this is the one adult I had helping me, <laughs> which was great. Uh, and, uh, but these, these are the chickens. I think they looked really delightful. You know, they look like whole chickens. They're not. They're there's no bones in them. You could just slice right through them. This was one of the pies they made, which doesn't, it's not a, it's a savory pie. And these are the ravioli, which I loved. I never knew that I would do a, a book on noodle soups when I was, was doing this, but I think that is just gorgeous and elegant. He probably would have garnished it more, but it's, that's the way they're served. Um, so let me go to, oh, and we did syllabubs. Syllabubs are just a delightful um, 17th, early 18th century thing that everyone loves. Um, you're supposed to actually take the milk directly from the cow and into a glass of sherry and then wait for it to froth up and come to the top. But we came close. This was good. Um, so this next venue, this was very recently. This was for the inauguration of the new food studies program uh, in San Francisco. And they said well, the president ha happens to own a, an apartment um, in this 
magnificent building in San Francisco, and there's like a sort of dining space in there that they let us use, which has the most spectacular view of the city I have ever seen. You can see the Bay Bridge and the Golden Gate for, on either side, and the whole sort of north end with Alcatraz and Marin County above it. It was amazing. So they said, do whatever you want. So we invited 20 sort of Bay Area food luminaries. You might recognize some of these people. Um, and um, they let me cook in there. What they didn't tell me is that there was nothing in there, not a single plate or knife or cup or anything. So we had to, and I'm based in Stockton, I'm not in San Francisco, so we had to rent every single item, put it in my van, all the ingredients, everything, and ship it to, and get it to San Francisco and uh, in the morning, and then I had to cook everything. There was no one to help me there. So, so it was a lot, and, but what was fun about it is I found this, um, this um, one of these Scalco books, uh, Giovanni Battista Rossetti, it's called Dello Scalco, in 1584, and I thought, um, okay, the uh, 20 people, I should, I should stick, I wanna follow his menu as exactly as I can. So this was literally a, um, a meal served for Her Serene Highness the Duchess of Urbino on the occasion of the marriage of Lady Margarita Catabeni to Sir Lanfranco Gianelli. I wanted the exact same meal. Um, I had to take out some of the courses, but otherwise it's, it's pretty much the same. Um, let me show you some of them. Um, oh, I was explaining the spices that go into everything f uh, beforehand um, and drinking, you know, various, uh, I think we were drinking something, some spice wine or something. Um, uh, so so it's, it wasn't a whole lot of people, but there, there was only me and two people to serve and I was doing all the cooking. Um, but anyway, there was a um, salad of peacock flesh in citron. Of course, I looked really hard for peacock. I could not find it. So, um, so I figured, you know, the turkey, everyone said turkey is the same or very similar, and they usually substituted that in the past. So turkey worked. There was a soup made of dates with uh, sugar and cinnamon, prosciutto on golden toast with fried sage and parsley, a sprout salad with Parmesan, an endive salad with cheese. So that's, that's sort of kind, of kind of typical of how these meals start. Um, I did, oh, I did four courses. There was a blancmange which can, with candied almonds. Blancmange is kind of pounded chicken with rose water and sugar and almond milk. So it looks like a chicken pudding. Can you imagine that? <laughs> um, with candy on it, you know? So um, capon tortelletti, which took me like two hours just to roll those by hand. Um, there's beef tongue on golden toasts. There's veal meatballs. And I actually use Scappy's recipe for that. I love it. It's beautiful. Uh, it's, it's in a uh, raisin sauce with meatballs made of veal. Lombard tarts with cream. Um, then the third course was apple tart, roasted turtle doves, and I did find those, they're beautiful, you'll see them in a moment. A tart of beans, bergamot pears roasted in the oven, cooked artichokes, and then the fourth course was uh, oranges in jelly, jars of prunes in syrup, um, the weirdest thing, gnocchi of peach. So you can imagine a gnocchi, like, like a pasta, but peach in, in it instead of uh, all dough, which was really interesting. Mostacholis, other things, so let me show you the pictures of what these look like. It was kind of a simple setting for the table, nothing extravagant. Um, but, but we had to stage everything in that same room. So that's the peacock salad, that's the artichokes, that's the tongue on toast, there's something other, you know, and setting out for, I think, five different tables, you had to really arrange it very carefully. Um, so everyone gets some. Those are the turtle doves. I love them. <laughs> They're just with the, the heads are on. You don't see that picture. Um, but I, I seriously tried to carve one of these, and I got it on a fork, lifted it in the air. I got a couple of slices off, and then I thought, I can't do this. So just, it's really very difficult. Um, and I think that might be the pictures. But let me um, let me talk about what are the grander lessons that I learned in these events, and and did the advice of the Scalco literature really work? And I would say, by and large, it did. Um, the first thing that they always say is you have to have your staff organized. Um, and they need to be instructed very carefully. Every person has to be given a separate task and a station. You can't overlap duties. You can't have intermediaries mess up your orders. You have to be there in front of everyone. Um, and I think, in fact, the only time something really went bad was when one person, an adult, <laughs> decided they, a dish should be done a certain way and it completely messed it up without asking me. Um, Another piece of excellent advice was buying very carefully with the whole menu in mind uh, for the number of guests, recording meticulously how much is spent. And what I find amazing, you wouldn't imagine it, but these people kept remarkably detailed accounts of every single penny spent. In fact, Mrs. Bugo still exists, his, his handwritten account books. Um, why they did it, 
I think is partly to avoid theft. They thought a huge staff is gonna steal some stuff, but they also really wanna keep within a certain budget and they don't wanna run out of food. That's the most important thing. If there's not enough food there, they look terrible. Um, now, of course, they gave all the leftovers to other people. So, you know, the staff ate basically every, anything that was left over. I didn't have an extra staff to feed. So I, you know, keeping in budget, I think was the best advice they could have given. Um, but, you know, in their case, most of these banquets they describe are 50 to 100 people. Um, you know, I was maybe working with half the amount, but still, that's, that's a lot. Um, the other thing um, was absolutely on target was keeping an account of the dishes themselves. You th think like, why would that be important? Um, sometimes multiple dishes are on the table at all, at, uh, well, they're always on the table at all times, um, rather than separate individual servings. So for one event, you might have to clean dishes from one course to serve the next course. So you need a lot of planning on the number. Um, in some, in fact, I decided to just count up the number of dishes that were used in one banquet thrown by Messis Bugo, uh, 12 courses, uh, 50 people went through 3,500 dishes. So it's a lot of, you know, sort of planning the dishes, just careful. Um, another remarkable thing I discovered is that with this kind of service, um, it's very hard to keep the hot dishes coming out of the menu at once and then follow with another hot course. And the way they, serve, they, they fix this problem, I think is ingenious, is hot and cold courses always alternate. So you have one hot course, then you in the Crescenziero, and a whole other kitchen serves the next course, and then you're cooking and the hot course goes out. So it's, it's not like there's a constant stream of things coming from the fire right to the, right to the table, which is impossible, really very hard to do, especially if you're putting everything on the table at once. You don't want empty space. So um, the timing of the serving also is amazing, and they give very, very good advice on that. I, of course, did everything on the fly, but um, good advice. But the most important lesson learned from all of these is the willingness to improvise. Make do with the kitchen and the equipment that you have at hand. Think fast. Everything never goes as planned, of course. Um, something burns, something is always undercooked, something will look dreadful <laughs> when it comes out, you know, and keeping your cool in the face of disaster, unlike Vatel, who runs himself through. <laughs> I think that's the best advice they could have possibly given. Um, and, uh, and, you know, and the w other part, I think, they don't say this, but you have to tell people, it may look bizarre, it may sound bizarre, taste it, and you'll like it, and it always works. So I'm going to end there. Thank you. <laughs> So I do have time for questions, and there's a mic if someone wants to ask anything at all. Okay. Linda has a question right up here. Yep. Shoot. If you could back up to the slide just before this, I'm just curious, were those artichokes cut with a pinking shears or Yes, what? isn't that ingenious? Thank okay. you, Dan. I love that. Right. I thought that, I, that was my idea, admittedly. All right. I, just, but, they, uh, they, I don't think Scoppy had that. Yeah, no. he, he didn't. Um, you know what it was? I was playing with pinking shears, and the one thing that you'd never know about them is they're great for making noodles. You can make little shell shapes with a pink set of pinking shears. Don't tell anyone, though, because I'm going to put that in my next book. <laughs> A, a, a biography of Catherine de Medici. Is there any truth to the old uh, um, rumor that it, she actually brought a great deal of the art of, of cooking to France when she married the King of France? No, she was a young girl. Um, she did come with chefs, but there's no evidence of what was served. Um, I think there's, she, she actually uh, overindulged in artichokes and got sick on her wedding night. Um, so, uh, now, whether the French had artichokes before or, or whether she introduced them, that's one claim. But when you talk about the art of cooking, the French have it in the Middle Ages. Teavant is there. Um, the cookbook that I translated is right about the times, 1540s. And what I found the most amazing is that all of these cookbooks, the, the Livre for Excellent de Cuisine, Messis Bugo, uh, the proper new book of cookery in England, uh, there's a Latin one that comes out of Switzerland, they're all borrowing from each other. They all read each, other, each other's, there's one recipe for snow. It's beautiful. It's, imagine sort of a frothy egg white thing that's pressed through a colander onto an apple with a little sprig of rosemary in it, so you get a little scene of snow that's 
light. It's in every single one of these cookbooks, the same recipe. So, so they're either get, all getting it from a common source or, they, or it's a popular dish they're all mentioning. But, it's, um, but to say the influence goes one way or the other, absolutely not. And all of these cookbooks also have um, recipes that are French or Hungarian or German or Spanish. So they all, they all know each other, <laughs> I think. And another question, anywhere? Great, go ahead, right, right here. There's a, pass the mic down. Did, did. Okay, um, if there is a period or, or, or a dish that you haven't had a chance to try yet, what, what would that be? Oh gosh, there's a whole lot of them, you know, and I think my expertise goes way, goes beyond the Renaissance era. I love ancient Rome and Greece. I, l I love cooking from Apicius. I've done that recently. Um, I did a, a 15th century Venetian bag. It was a little meal, but it was a lot of fun recently. Um, but where I really get in, into trouble is um, with Chinese recipes, partly because they're, they're translations. Um, when I was teaching at Boston, we did a um, Han, no, it couldn't have been Han Dynasty, it must be Tang Dynasty, um, meal from a, from a cookbook, and there was carp in some kind of strange sauce. Carp is disgusting fish. <laughs> I don't know whether anyone's eaten it, but it was like vile, like the most vile, like people would not go near it. And I don't know whether it was just the fish itself or we did something wrong. There was another lamb dish with mastic, you know, so it's like that resiny thing that, that, that they get from kiosk. That was really not so great either. So, so I, think, I think, you know, it's partly the translations maybe are not great. It's partly that I don't understand all the techniques and things. So there are dishes a whole lot of them that I would love to cook um, that uh, require, mostly require game. I think the, um, the pheasant stuffed back into its feathers is something I've always wanted to do. One of my students at BU did it and actually um, I had to shoot a pheasant to do it, you know, so I don't hunt, but it would, that would be fun. Or a peacock, imagine like serving a, what looks like a live peacock, <laughs> but it's cooked inside. That would, I'm, I'm game for that, I would, I would do it. Um, and you know, sometimes you, I like to sort of push the border of what's strange in food just because it's fun. So um, that would be up there. <laughs> Are there any ancient recipes you've tried that have remained unchanged for the most part that we still eat today commonly? Hmm. Ancient, do you mean like ancient Rome, ancient times? Yeah, there's, there are some that are so close, but they're missing like one ingredient. So if you can imagine uh, what they called laganai in ancient um, Greece and Rome, it's where the word lasagna comes from, it's a, or tracta. It's a big sheet of dough, basically. And there's re a recipe that I love in Cato the Elder, who's an um, a agronom, agri agricultural writer. And he takes cheese and spreads it on layers of these tracta and pours honey over it. And if you were to just take that honey out and add tomato sauce, it is lasagna. It's the exact same dish, you know, even though he's not boiling them first and doing that. But there are a lot of those that are um, really, really close, that, that are, that, especially in Italian food. You know, Italians are the most conservative eaters on earth. I know you wouldn't guess that. They don't like things that aren't done exactly the way they've always been done. So, so like, there are um, 15th century pasta dishes that look exactly the same. Um, it's just that a few new ingredients come in. Tomatoes, obviously, peppers, corn, uh, potatoes, <laughs> but, but otherwise, they're, they're basically the same dishes. Yeah. Another one all the way over there, sure. Good. When you cook from Roman antiquity, what do you f use as the most uh, modern equivalent of garum? That well, it, it, this is garum or liquamen. It's a fish sauce. I think nookmam is pretty close. Um, they had solid versions and liquid versions, but it's fish sauce, basically. Um, to address that specific question, I made it a few years ago. It takes about a year. And imagine just taking handfuls of fish and salt, throwing them in a jar and forgetting about it for a year. And it rots and it starts to smell. And you think, oh my God, I'm going to kill myself. But you pour off the liquid. I haven't killed myself yet, which is amazing to me. But it's, um, you pour off the liquid from that. And it, this mine was a little funkier, but it tasted a lot like regular fish sauce. Um, and I think that's, there are recipes. They're fifth century. They're from Byzantium. Um, and they, they're, they mostly use the whole fish because you want the guts and the bacteria in there to, to make the whole thing ferment. Um, but, but no, nookmam and nampla work fine. I think that's, that's good. In fact, there's a recipe I love, which is... Um, pork and apricots and fish sauce and vinegar and honey, and it's basically stewed together. Um, that's, that's a really lovely one, a minutal, which I've made many times.
one of your early slides seemed to show ice in a drinking glass. Did they have ice? Yes, they would go up to the mountains, wrap it in hay and bury it in the ground. Um, and the fashion for drinking um, wine with snow isn't, does, the cookbooks don't mention it very much, but you get to the medical literature, they're like, I cannot believe people are drinking iced wine. It's gonna cause, I think they, they thought it was a kind of apoplexy or stroke. We call it brain freeze now. Try guzzling <laughs> wine with snow in it. It's really pleasant, but if you do it too fast, it hits the top of your palate, you get that brain freeze. They thought that's gonna kill you. Um, so people did that, definitely. Um, you know, not as easily as we do with the freezer, but, um, but yeah, ice is, and, and of course, in the century, the 16th century, and especially in the 17th century, they invent um, ice cream. So you need ice and a bucket inside of it and saltpeter to bring the temperature down, but they make ice cream, definitely. So uh, all these uh, initial spices that you hunted for, were any in particular, did you feel like they were totally underappreciated in our contemporary Yeah, a whole lot of spices I really wish would come back. And I think, I would say my favorite is grains of paradise. This is malagueta pepper, comes from the, the west coast of Africa. And it's sort of like pepper, but it has this nutty, coconutty, spicy kind of flavor. It's beautiful. Um, I think, um, gosh, what a spikenard is lovely. It has a piney kind of flavor. Um, uh, galangal, which you can find in any Asian shop, Middle Ages, they love that. And it's not quite ginger. It's got like a mustardy, burning you know, flavor. Um, so there's a lot of them that I, that I really wish would come back. And I, think, and I could say that about cuisine in general. You know, people are always looking for the latest, new, hot, interesting, authentic thing from around the world. Take a step backward 100, 200 years, and you'll find a whole different cuisine, very different flavor profiles, different ways of cooking, techniques that we have really lost in the West, one which is bizarre. And you'd say, why would you do this? Imagine parboiling a chicken, taking it off, then spit roasting it and larding it, and, and you'd think, well, you've just lost all the flavor in the broth. It makes it firm, and it holds it on the spit you know, in a way so it doesn't flop around. There's things that, that seem kind of counterintuitive. They would often twice cook things, um, often. Um, and some flavored the combinations that go together in Renaissance cooking, like you could imagine um, like a broth and sugar and spices and pepper, a lot of pepper, so it's spicy and salty and sour with vinegar. And some of these things taste exactly like barbecue sauce today. <laughs> so it's not, you know, they're really not that weird, but, um, but I would say that's, that's uncharted territory for most cooks. All the way back there. Okay, so uh, you mentioned Cato the Elder, yeah. and you mentioned Rome, and then I, I was under the impression that uh, pasta came from China and that tomatoes came from the Americas. Yeah. So I don't know how you mentioned tomato sauce with Rome when, first, when nothing would happen until the 1600s. Yeah, I didn't mention tomato sauce. The first tomato recipe is Antonio Latini. It's 1696. Uh, and it's a salsa. It's actually chopped up salsa. It's a Spanish influence. Um, people, their tomato was a little earlier, 1540s. Um, so no, there are no tomatoes obviously before that. And, what, and the other thing that was um, in Cato, I've forgotten what it was now, but um, is noodles. No, noodles, um, this is a big argument among people. You know, obviously Mark, people said, Marco Polo went to China and discovered noodles and brought them back. No, what he actually said was, look, they have noodles just like ours. <laughs> so, uh, you know, the, there's a couple of different arguments. Itria is probably one origin in the Arab world. It's related to tria, which is an ancient Greek word. So I think, um, and I'm gonna argue this, that noodles are independently discovered all over the world among anyone who has wheat. They're gonna figure out eventually how to make pasta of some kind. Um, and there are some techniques, the, 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 my evidence, I think, for lack of mutual influence, is there are techniques in China you never ever see in Italy. And there's things they do in Italy that you would never see in, um, in China in, in terms of noodles. The Italians don't understand. You can put long noodles in soup. They don't do that, really, because they don't have chopsticks, and they don't need it that way, you know. So, so they're, they're separate cultures, I think, entirely. And there's the Middle, middle Asia, you know, kind of a, the central steppes, have hundreds of noodle dishes that have nothing to do with anyone. So I would say independent discovery. Uh, the woman in front asked about spices that you'd like to see come back. Are there any spices from the readings you've done that you can't find and can't figure out what they were? Um, 
you know, none come to mind. They're usually I know the species, if not the if I can't even if I can't get it. Um, the 17th century has a lot of musk in it, and that's illegal. Actually, ambergris is illegal also. I got it illegally, but um, the, <laughs> don't tell anyone. The because um, it's a whale product, you know, even though you don't harm the whale and, and when you find it on the beach. But um, musk, I'm really intrigued about that. I wonder how what it tastes like. Um, and then there, no, it's not spices so much. It's, it's ingredients more than anything. Um, I did, I was able once, uh, Bartolomeo Scappi has every animal that he could ever imagine, recipes for hedgehog, um, for bear, in fact, and I've cooked that one, a bear's um, thigh, roasted. Um, so anyway, yeah, there's, there's not a lot you can't find. It's game is the really hard thing is that we don't really eat many of those animals anymore. What do you attribute the use of sugar with meat in so many dishes? It's sugar, so interesting, yeah. and we don't really do it very much. They loved sugar, and they put it on everything. God, um, Platina says at one point, there's no dish that's not made better with sugar. So, so you can imagine it goes on pasta and meat and chicken and everything. And, and we tend to think sugar is kind of for children, it's candy, it's infantilized food, and it's a flavor that's not very sophisticated because it's cheap, and we can get it anywhere, and sugar and candy is, you know, it's crap, it's junk food. For them, it was really expensive. Before the, it was grown in Brazil with slave labor and elsewhere, um, you throw sugar on a dish, it, it bespeaks wealth. So I think it's partly a conspicuous consumption, literally, you're eating the sugar, um, and, and you rarely, you know, often it is sprinkled on top so people know it's there. But, um, but I think it's also, it's also a health matter. They, sugar, strangely, in humoral theory, is classified as hot and moist, will create good blood and balanced humors, and is very nutritious, among the most nutritious things you can find. So doctors recommended sugar. I hope we come back to that someday. I really am. I'm, I'm in for it. So I think I'm going to stop there. Thank you.